Well, hello. How are you all out there? I am so excited to see you here today. We have a rockin' class together talking about Minecraft education and climate futures and uh, the farm. I'm so excited to dig in. I would like to quickly introduce myself along with my colleague this morning. I am Bailey. I'm coming to you from Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, and my pronouns are she and her. I'll be guiding you through this lesson today, just like I would in my normal classroom when I'm a teacher normally. I'm joined by the fabulous and the famous Dan. Dan, how are you today? <laughs> I'm great, Bailey. How are you? I'm good, thanks. So yeah, I'm uh, currently located in Waterloo, Ontario, Treaty 9, and my pronouns are he and him. And I am a global Minecraft mentor and Minecraft consultant. So, um, yeah, I do everything Minecraft. Everything. Wait, wait till you guys see what he can do. Before we dive really deep, I just want to do a brief land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that I live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory, which is kind of the northwestern part of Canada. This land is the ancestral and traditional territory of Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Métis people. Um, I would like to thank the traditional knowledge keepers and the elders who've gone before us and those who are with us today for continuing to keep culture alive and tell stories and um, give us so many opportunities for learning. Uh, this land acknowledgement is an act of reconciliation and gratitude and is only one small part of the reconciliation work in my life. And I recognize that that work involves many aspects of my life, including the ways in which I educate. I uh, thank you for joining me for that land acknowledgement. And I also would like to thank Minecraft Education Edition. We here at Cobblestone Collective are so proud to partner with Minecraft Education Edition and bring you really awesome things like playing Minecraft during class, during Earth Week. How cool are we for hanging out and doing stuff like this during school? It can't get better than this. It really can't. All right, this is like a normal classroom. We're kind of, it's kind of a normal day, except for one small thing. I can usually see and hear my students. You can see and hear me normally, but I have no idea who's out there, but I have a solution for this. So what I would like for you to do is on your device, I would like you to go to the cc.page slash earth. And I would like you to answer this really quick question for me. I'm curious if you have ever been on a farm before and what your favorite thing is about farms. Have you ever been on a farm before and what is your favorite thing about farms? Dan, have you been on a farm before? Uh, yes, I've been um, to many farms. Our uh, elementary school used to take us on a local tour of the orchards and farms um, when I was back in primary school. Um, I think if I remember back to my favorite thing, it was certainly the animals and the hayloft. They let us run around in the hayloft and jump in all the hay and <laughs> <laughs> that's fun. That sort of thing. Maybe awesome. not a daily uh, farm occurrence for, for people that actually live and work on a farm though. Nice, nice. Uh, so I grew up on a farm. So yes, I lived and worked on a farm. Um, I grew up on a beef ranch here in East Central Alberta. And my favorite thing about farms because I grew up on them is the people because my favorite people still <laughs> work and live on farms. So we have lots of people in the chat. Thank you all for sharing your responses with us. This is awesome. Uh, Emma's favorite thing is seeing all of the animals. Olivia's favorite thing is the horses. Me too, Olivia. I love horses. Uh, Rachel's favorite thing is holding the baby animals. This is the perfect time of year for that. There's so many baby animals on farms mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we have Madame Stewart's class, and she says that they love farms in her classroom. Rounds Ranch is a great local farm to visit in their area. Oh, I know Central County. Nice. And um, Madame Stewart would also like to say hello from her grade seven, eight French immersion online class. Hello, Madame Stewart's classes. Uh, let's see, Imani has been on a farm and their favorite thing is the tractor. Do you see any cool responses in here, Dan, you'd like to share? Yeah, I think we've got one from Scott and uh, grade five in Kitchener and close to where I am right now. 
Uh, mm -hmm. He's got a grandmother that lives on a farm and they have horses and chickens. And there's a forest. That's pretty cool. Um, oh, that is really cool. Eva, her favorite thing is sheep. I love sheep. Um, nice. Yeah. Uh, I like Mickey's. The organized work is Mickey's favorite part. It does <laughs> take a lot of organized work, that's for sure. Okay, thank you all for these really awesome responses. We are going to have an amazing day because I can tell that you are amazing and this is going to be great. Today's plan really briefly is to dig into Minecraft right away. We are going to be in Minecraft in less than three minutes and we're going to tour this awesome world called Climate Futures The Farm. And then we have the coolest guest speaker I think ever in the history of guest speakers. We have Jacqueline joining us from Parabug. And just a teaser, Jacqueline and her company use bugs to fight. I don't know. I won't tell you what they fight, <laughs> but they use bugs. And I'm so excited for you all to meet Jacqueline and hear about their invention and how they're impacting, um, lessening the inputs into agriculture with their invention. It's so cool. It's so cool. Once Jacqueline has been here, we are going to say farewell. We have lots of time for questions for Jacqueline. And then we are going to have time to build our own world or not our own world, sorry. We're going to have our build our own climate future invention. And I'm so excited to see what sort of genius you all come up with. I'm sure it's going to be a be great. All right, so let's dig in. I'll walk you through how to log in with these screenshots and then Dan will show us one final time. If at any point we are going too fast or your class isn't quite ready to be into Minecraft yet, you can pause this video and Dan and I will be right here. It's magical. <laughs> so pause <laughs> us at any time if things are going too fast and um, just press play on the video again when you're ready to start. So of course you need to sign into Minecraft Education Edition and you'd use your regular school username and password for that. Then you're going to choose play. After you choose play, you're going to choose view library. After you choose view library, you choose subjects kits. I see Daniel in the chat says, is this the same as what we did yesterday? Daniel must have joined us for our kickoff yesterday. But this is where it's different. We're choosing subject kits, Daniel. And yes, it's the exact same controls and everything that we did yesterday. Subject kits, you're going to scroll down all the way to the bottom of those subject kits and choose climate and sustainability. And then choose climate futures the farm and finally you're going to choose create world and you'll have a loading screen and you might have to wait a minute and if it's taking a long time to load on your wi-fi at school just pause this video and we will be right here okay dan are you ready to walk us through that one more time i am all right okay here we are and i'm going to click play I'm going to go to view library over in the right corner of the screen here. And we're going to subject kits up in the top left corner. Now I'm going to scroll down here. I have to scroll down to the bottom because the climate and sustain sustainability um, tile is down at the bottom here in the center of the screen. So I'm going to click on that. And then we have to go looking for the farm. So it's actually in the second row at the very end on the far right. So once I click that, all I need to do now is create world and just patiently wait for it to generate. And there we go. So mine might be a little bit faster than yours. I'm using a gaming rig. If you're using a Chromebook, it may take a couple of more minutes. So just be patient while it loads. Awesome. So good. So it looks like we're in the farm den. Mm -hmm. um, so we have uh, three jobs to do here today. We need to find Emily, who is a climate scientist and who will be guiding us through this world. She has all sorts of things to share with us about the learning we need to do today in order to be well-informed inventors when it comes to our build time. Then we have three separate areas to explore. And you see those blue sprinkles on my sheet, on my screen? Those blue sprinkles tell us that we have to complete things before we can get into that area. So if you can't pass the blue sprinkles, you have to back up because you haven't found all of the rifts 
in each area. When you enter those rifts, make sure you look around before and after because things will change when you go into the rift. All right, so Dan and I are going to walk together through the first little bit of Minecraft with you. And then we will leave you to explore on your own. So just go ahead and start exploring on your own. If you're a little confused, check out Dan and I's screen and we can help you out. And then we'll have about 20 minutes to explore all on our own. Okay, Dan, take it away. All right, so you'll note here we are in survival mode. Um, so don't walk into fires or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> and we're gonna walk over here and I believe this is Emily. So let's talk to Emily first. And actually, before I jump fully in, I'm just going to quickly mention something called Immersive Reader. If you have not used or heard of Immersive Reader before, what it does is it does speech to text and it also does translation. So it's really good for situations where English may be a second language or if you're an emerging uh, reader. And any NPC will have a button down here. And I, I'm just hovering my mouse over and it's lighting up green right now. You can activate the immersive reader by clicking that button and it will open up and take you into immersive reader. So I've got a lot of different options here. And if I click play, it will read this out to me. I don't know if you can hear that or not. No, we can't hear it, but I think okay. I get the idea. Yeah. So this uh, is super are, cool. Yeah. And there's settings down here as well. I can change. The voice, I can change the voice speed. This is quite important here. Uh, additionally, I can click on words. It will read the words for me. So I'm not having specific problems with a word. I can just click on it. Uh, and the translation is over here in reading preferences. So if I click on here, I can actually choose a language. I can scroll down and click any language I want here. And if I click on document here and toggle that on, it'll actually convert the whole script into that language for me. So it's a pretty cool, flexible tool. The other way that you can access Immersive Reader is if you, you can actually read off of slates and posters and boards and that sort of thing as well. And to access that, just press the I on your keyboard while you're looking at the slate and Immersive Reader will pop up and read that, that slate or poster or board description for you. Awesome. All right, so let's see what Emily has to say. Welcome to Climate Futures. So we're going to learn about agriculture and how it affects climate change. So there's a bunch of areas to explore. We've got three, um, and we can go off and explore. Um, so I'm not going to do this, but you can do this uh, at your own computer. Um, they're going to give you a camera and a portfolio so you can take pictures and compare um, the different areas after we go through a rift. All right, so let's go and start exploring. And there's a bit of a guide here. You can grab one of these books from the chest. It's uh, the location hunt where you can take the pictures. All right, we don't need to worry super lots about the pictures if you're interested in coming That's back right. and taking pictures, for sure you can do that. We're focused on the learning so that we can get to the building. Okay, so you do have to watch as you're walking through because uh, it can sometimes be easy to miss an area. So mm -hmm. uh, you won't be able to pass on to the next one until you've completed it all, so you can always backtrack. But as you can see here, the path goes on, and this is the first area. So let's jump in here and take a look around. So I've got a rift over here, but I'm going to go see what's going on first over here. So we've got these tractors pulling... Looks like they're fertilizing the fields with something kind of purple. So let's talk to Emily about what's going on here. So farmers use fertilizers to help their crops go bigger and faster. So they need nutrients when the soil quality is poor. So there are two types of fertilizers, natural and chemical. Uh, so natural fertilizers are made up of organic substances, so uh, animal manure and so forth, and chemical fertilizers are manufactured out of inorgan inorganic elements by people. Um, 
So natural fertilizers are better for the environment. They can help the soil retain moisture and risk erosions. However, natural fertilizers usually contain smaller amounts of nutrients. Okay, so there's a bit of a trade-off here mm -hmm. between right. uh, the two of them. Uh, so chemical fertilizers can cause problems when they run into waterways, such as rivers and streams. Okay. Production of chemical fertilizers is also responsible for increasing the amount of greenhouse gases. So there's definitely a lot of trade-offs here. Um, but they enable farmers to grow more crops at faster speeds. Okay, so let's go through the rift now and see what kind of changes will occur to this field. All right, I'm going to walk through. Ooh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've got a new sign over here, and there is, looks like some, an interesting irrigation kind of thing going on here and some water sprinklers. Let's see what it is. Besides the direct effects chemical fertilizers have on the environment, it costs a lot of energy and fossil fuels to produce and transport those fertilizers. Natural fertilizers can be created locally. So I think that's a really good point there. So you're not having to haul the stuff all over the place. You're not using all that petroleum product trying to, to truck the stuff in. Uh, today, scientists are working on new technologies which allow us to produce highly efficient fertilizers at the farm itself. Uh, and researchers are even working on, and I had trouble with this word yesterday. <laughs> Maybe can you help me out with it again with it? Yeah, it was fertigation. Fertigation. <laughs> I Fertilizing and irrigating. <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> that is great. This is the process of delivering fertilizer in the water farmers already use for irrigation. So this is a pretty cool use of iron bars here and having a water effect to sprinkle out of the top. Yeah, that's a really cool building. I love it. Uh-huh. And again, use a good use of the hoppers here on this tractor. Uh, Minecraft is all about picking things that may not necessarily have, you know, have a different use in mind and then using them to make something look uh, like something else. So let's see here. Different types of natural fertilizers. Manure, this is the solid waste products animals use and is widely used for farms. And we all recognize that smell when we're driving around farmer fields in the spring mm -hmm. and in the fall. Um, contains high levels of nutrients that crops need. Due to the way manure is broken down or decomposed by organisms, it has the benefit of a slow release over a long period of time. Okay, I didn't know that. Hmm. Lime, agricultural lime or crushed limestone makes the soil less acidic. It makes it easier for some crops to absorb the nutrients already present in the soil. And potash, this is a common name for different types of salts that contain, contain high levels of potassium, which is essential for plant growth. Very cool. There's lots of potash plants in Saskatchewan, actually. It's like a big part of their manufacturing there. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. So, Dan, that's nice. how the rifts work, hey? Yeah. So okay, we've got so one I'm... more. Yeah, okay, so go ahead. ahead. You go ahead. Go to that rift. <laughs> All right. I'm going to jump over to the rift here, and it will, I'm assuming, change things back to the way it was. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So now you need to walk on and carry on to mm -hmm. the next rift. All right. So if I missed anything there that I want to revisit just very quickly, I can jump through that rift again and it will reset the whole process. But yeah, let's walk awesome. on to the next one. Okay, we'll I will give... give one final shout out yeah. and then we can let everybody play and enjoy some silence as they learn about um, all of the really cool things. And we'll do a little recap at the end. Mm -hmm. So my final shout out goes to Mrs. Luby's class, who doesn't believe that we're live. We're live. <laughs> we are. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Luby's class from Ottawa. Nice to see you. You cannot get out of the fenced uh, area, people at St. Gregory's. So you have to follow along. Try to find Emily. Try to click on the yellow sparkles and find the rifts. Um, and you will have a lot to learn. Okay, we will see you in about 10 minutes. And hopefully you make most your way through most of the world. We'll see you then. I'm just going to carry on doing these activities and exploring here.
Oh, wow. Okay. Supplementing their diet with seaweed. 50% left to make nine. Cool. Right way here, yeah. Oh, no, I got turned around. I see a few people in our form are having trouble getting started, and I think it's because you haven't grabbed the notebook from the chest. So make sure you grab that notebook from the chest, and then you'll be able to enter into the farm and check out the world. I love these combines. <laughs> I know, they're them. so cool. <laughs> like the use of the cauldron, that's uh, mm -hmm. very effective. <laughs> and uh, the stone cutter things here, they use it. Yeah, that's uh, it's very inventive, imaginative. Mm -hmm. So we've got some desertified land here, so let's see. Oh, this is much nicer. That's a pretty neat train they've got there. Okay, I cannot jump into the canal. Yesterday I was worried about falling in, falling in there. <laughs> You're safe. That was going to be worry. a bit more adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I really do like the the barge. Yeah, the builders yeah. of this world were just they went all out on it. I think mm -hmm. it's so cool. And there's a lot of existing canals that have been left over from prior to the industrial uh, era in Europe. So that's something that could potentially take use of again is, is all those old canal systems, which they used to use back in the 17 and 1600s and long before that to transport goods all across the place. Right. Yeah, that's sometimes the, the technology that's most efficient isn't brand new. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's repurposing and reusing old technology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, now you see lots of wind turbines here, some renewable energy sources. These are supposed to be electric powered vehicles. Mm, that's cool. All right. Oh, back through the rift. Dan, while you're exploring, I want to tell you mm -hmm. to. Um, two shout outs that were in not two shout outs two responses that were in the form it's just really funny how the comparing them so just be said i like to i live beside fam, my family's rice fields it's so organized and then Otto said i went to many maple farms so think oh, about okay. the, the differences in the climate Required mm -hmm. to build to grow those two different products. I just it's really cool. Yeah, they have a they have a maple uh, farm around uh, here actually, just up um, on the way to Toronto. I've been there a few times. It's it's pretty fascinating because you can watch the whole process and walk around the whole thing and see how they get the maple out of the, the syrup mm -hmm. or the sap out of the trees, and then see the process of them actually turning it into syrup. Yeah. And you can buy. You can buy it fresh right there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dan, are you still in the world with the trucks? Is this yes, still part so, of that rift? Okay, perfect. So Riley right, so. in the form is a little stuck. So Riley, I'm just going to ask you to watch Dan go past this rift and you'll see exactly where to go to get into the next one. Yeah, as I said earlier, it is easy, particularly in this area. I found I got lost a couple of times trying to find my my way out. So uh, we're near these large storage facilities right now, and the trucks were just back up the road a little bit. Um, and then after that, it took us to a market. Markets are great things. And uh, this is a meat processing plant. Great use of nether. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really quite, cool. uh, yeah. And another area with some trucks. I think yesterday I got a little bit spun around in here as well. Mm -hmm. Can I go through here? Yeah, okay, I did. And this is a supermarket, so it's another area with trucks. Yeah, so Riley, if this is the one you're in, there's actually a door in the supermarket. So you have to go into the supermarket. So hopefully you can find your way out, find your way back to Emily. We have. So there's the door there. Yeah, perfect. So this is just a friendly reminder that we have two minutes left in this part of our lesson here today. If you need more time, just pause the video. It's totally okay if you'd like to pause us and carry on exploring in this world and finding Emily and all the cool riffs. I know it goes by quickly, um, so do not worry about pausing. We have two minutes left. Yeah, I'm just going to rush through the rest here so that I can get to the end and be ready for the build challenge later. Yeah, I definitely like going to markets over supermarkets. Much more friendly, customized service. I know the market that we've been visiting for years, we were on very good first name basis with the, the owners and uh, they know what we like and know to point uh, us in the direction. And if they've got something unique there that day, it's, it's, it's a much nicer experience. After the supermarket, you go to a landfill site. So it's this 91% uh, of plastic that isn't recycled. This is such a cool world. 
Oh my goodness, you're back to Emily. And we're back full circle. Awesome. So, if you did not have enough time to come find Emily back by the campfire, that's totally okay. Uh, we are moving on because we have a really awesome guest in the behind behind the curtain over here, and we cannot wait to bring her out to join us. And just have a one reflection question for you as we transition here into the next part of our lesson. And we would like to know now that you've learned about some of the impacts that agriculture and our food production has on Earth. What might you or your family do to reduce your impact? So we learned a little bit about desertification due to overuse of chemical fertilizers and insecticides and pesticides. Uh, we learned a little bit about um, the ways that transportation and transporting those goods um, affects climate change and global warming. We learned a little bit about um, the ways that we deal with waste and um, transfer stations and um, how come I can't think of the word, Dan? When you bury all of the garbage under the ground, it is called a um, landfill. Landfill, right. <laughs> a landfill. We saw a landfill <laughs> that right. being, uh, changed into a uh, park. Park, parkland, um, yeah. Yeah, we saw the importance of supporting and buying from local producers as much as possible to cut down on transportation costs. And we learned a little bit about packaging and how much packaging waste is involved in mm -hmm. food. So we have some awesome responses here coming in. Um, Noah, Noah's family likes to recycle and not waste anything. Um, Gabrielle's family is trying hard to, to lessen their pollution so that plants can have a good chance to thrive. Mm -hmm. um, for me, one of my ways that I help um, lessen my impact is that we uh, we just try to cut down food waste as much as possible. Dan, what about you? Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing uh, for us. And I think one of the key takeaways from this is is trying to do as much local as possible. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we, we try to shop locally, source from markets local, uh, eat seasonally. So we don't go looking for fruits out of season that we can't get locally. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of meal planning to make sure that we're reducing waste. Uh, and if you're doing it local at a market, it's probably not coming in a lot of plastic packaging either. Right. Yeah. Great idea, Dan. All right. Now is the time. I am so, so, so excited to welcome Jacqueline. Jacqueline, hi. Hello. Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? Good, good. good. How are you? So I tease this, you and the students by saying that you use bugs to fight. Could you tell yeah. us a little bit about what you do, Jacqueline, and so what Parabug is? My name is, sorry, drop something. My name uh -oh. is Jacqueline. I'm a co-owner of Parabug, and we use drones. We drop good bugs to fight the bad bugs or the pests that farmers try to control that are damaging their crops. So Super cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So we need to have some responses from our friends watching live here so that we can make it a little bit real for them. So I'm curious what everybody's favorite fruit or vegetable is. Uh, my personal favorite is strawberries. Dan, what about yours? <laughs> Mike, back on. My, my favorite fruit? Um, I, I definitely like strawberries. I'm also a big fan of apples. Nice. Awesome. Uh, Jacqueline, your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I would probably <laughs> say strawberries too. Nice. Nice. Strawberries nice. or raspberries. <laughs> it's awesome. So the reason why we're asking this, so we have a couple answers coming in now. Kieran loves honeydew melon. Me too. Uh, Jordan loves apples. Gianna loves strawberries and blueberries. So we have a lot of strawberry lovers in the crowd today. Noah likes strawberries and potatoes. So is there something to do with strawberries with your work, Jacqueline? Definitely. You guys are going to learn okay. a little bit more about strawberries and biocontrol. Um, so biocontrol is what we call beneficial insects. Um, and we actually use those beneficial insects on a lot of the fruits that you guys mentioned. So it's pretty exciting stuff. We're just going to talk about a couple today, but um, if you love strawberries and you're going to like this next part. 
Awesome. Okay, I'm going to show this video, Jacqueline. I will give a warning that there are some very close up videos of bugs coming up. So if you're a little bit finicky about bugs, you might want to have your hands ready to cover <laughs> your eyes. All right, here we go. This mite is super small, roughly the size of a grain of salt. But its oversized appetite makes it one of the most daunting threats farmers face. Unchecked, they devastate crops, like these delicious strawberries. You'll know these mites by their calling card, dry, rusty leaves and by these messy webs that give our tiny foe its name, the two-spotted spider mite. It's not really a spider, but it is an arachnid, so it's related. And it does have two dark spots. It sucks the juices from the strawberry plant's leaves with its needle-like stylet. Sip after sip, row after row, Pretty soon, the leaves won't be able to absorb enough sunlight to fuel the plant. Farmers use pesticides, but spider mites quickly become resistant. So farmers formed a strategic alliance with a bolder batter mite, Persimilis. Persimilis is a predator. It only eats other mites, and its favorite is the two-spotted spider mite. The tiny carnivores arrive in bottles packed with vermiculite, a lightweight mineral that gives them something to hold on to. But spreading them by hand takes a ton of time. So some farmers are taking this old battle to the next level. They're calling in air support. Drones packed with Persimilis. The predatory paratroopers rain down on the field below. The moment they land, the bright red Persimilis start hunting down the unwelcome vegetarians. Persimilis are blind. They track down their prey with palps that sense vibrations and smells. Plants under attack by spider mites release pheromones. Those signals lead Persimilis right to their prey. They tear into their prey with biting pincers called chelicery and slurp out the innards. Persimilis have a taste for eggs, too. Caviar, anyone? Mmm. Eventually, this skilled hunter is so successful, it exhausts its only source of food. When the feasting's done, the Persimilis can't survive. The field goes quiet. The strawberries are safe, at least until the spider mites return to face another fight from the skies. Hey. Sorry, I was muted. It's not an online lesson if I'm not muted at one point, right? <laughs> okay, that is so cool, Jacqueline. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable. That's just <laughs> such a cool technology. And I love how it's like technology, but also bugs. So it's bringing the two together. It's primitive really and awesome. modern. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's so cool. Yeah. So my friends that are watching, you have opportunity to ask Jacqueline any question you like. You can put them in our handy dandy form that we know and love. Mm -hmm. And I will be sure to shout those out to Jacqueline as they come in. Yeah. So 
Jacqueline, give us a rundown. How come, how come parabug? How come bugs? <laughs> so historically, um, bugs were actually released by hand. So it took a lot of people and a lot of time to walk through a field to put out these good bugs. Um, and there were a lot of crops that weren't able to use them um, because of some of those challenges, whether it was labor or access into the tops of the trees. Um, so Parabug has really given farmers and a lot of different crops the ability to use good bugs to help control those bad bugs. So it's made it a lot less expensive. Um, and we can fly in fields that maybe people can't walk in, whether it's because it's muddy or, like I said, that they can't reach a high up into the trees. Um, so that's those are the, the, the big reasons that we're using a drone to apply the beneficial insects. So I know there's another video that yeah, show the different crops that we work in. I mean, you don't have to play the whole thing, but um, just gives Perfect. a little, little more of a video. Sure, we'll watch this. I'll mute it so we can talk over there it. There you go. Too. So this is, this is an almond orchard. So it's not just fruits, but we also release into nut orchards. So these are almonds. We also work in pistachios. Um, we fly in grapes. So this is uh, a, a vineyard um, and there's lots and lots of different bugs that we're releasing as well. Um, and we're flying in some field crops, so like broccoli, celery, lettuce, um, melons, which I heard earlier was somebody's favorite. Um, so there's a lot of different um, crops that beneficial insects or good bugs can be used in to help farmers control some of those pests. Very cool. Well, lots of good questions coming in now. All right. Dan, would you like to ask one of them? Sure. Um, let's see here. Uh, one, one of them that come up quite a few times, Eaton's asked, um, do you get to control the drones? Yeah. So the drone can be flown by the pilot who's on the ground or it can fly by itself. So when a pilot shows up to the field, they can actually on their controller, they can map, put um, points the drone will fly to. And then from there, the drone will fly autonomously or fly by itself. So autonomously means that um, a piece of equipment operates by itself on its own without a human driver. Um, so it can fly either way. Hmm. It's kind of like a video really cool. game. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, so, how many bugs are in that drone? Maybe, but maybe we should watch that video of the bugs falling. Sure, yeah. And okay, so we'll give the bugs view. <laughs> what it looks like it's very noisy up there in the joint. It is. So, this <laughs> camera is actually on the drone as it's flying, and you can see the pilot there on the ground. Um, and so this shows how the drums actually rotate and how that material falls. Um, and in that drum right there, there are, let's see here, probably 250,000 bugs. Wow. <laughs> yeah. A quarter of a million bugs? <laughs> yeah, that, that would do about, about 20 acres of strawberries right there. Wow, that is really cool. Yeah. So Matthew asks, um, are the bugs dangerous to humans? Nope. They are only dangerous to other small bugs. So these guys are, they're so small, you can't really see them with a the naked eye. That's why we had that video at the beginning so that you could actually see what a persimilis might look like um, because they're so hard to see without those special cameras. But they are not dangerous to people. Um, they don't. They, they don't even know you're there. They're too busy with the other bugs that they're hunting. <laughs> I love that. They're very, very mighty warriors. They are. They are. <laughs> That's they awesome. Are. And I actually I had a question of my own because I was talking about this with my family and telling them how cool it was over for dinner last night. And I was interested to know um, the reason for using vermiculite uh, and, and that deployment. Yeah, so um, we use vermiculite or rice holes. So rice okay. holes are what are like a, a byproduct of rice production. So there, it's it's the the casing that goes around a grain of rice. So we also mm -hmm. use that. Um, the reason for that is um, to give the bugs something to kind of hold on to, and because when they fall out of the drone, they fall really gently, 
And so there's no extra force put on the bugs. They just fall um, by their own, their own terminal velocity or, or, oh, okay. or the way that they fall, they would mm -hmm. fall on their own without force. And it's a biodegradable material uh, with the rice husks. The right, yeah, the rice husks are biodegradable, and um, the vermiculite is is a a naturally sourced, um, basically a rock. It's a really really uh, fine uh, rock, essentially mm -hmm. mineral. I guess would be the nice. words. Yeah. So Jacqueline, I know you have the tube there. Could you show us yeah, the absolutely. situation? Thanks. Yeah. So when we show up to a oh, um, to a field, um, we will show up and there will be bottles of bugs like this. So we'll talk a little bit more about where those come from in a second. But so we show up, we'll get the bottles, we load the tube. So we'll take the lid off, load the tube. Then, then this whole tube mounts up onto the drone. And then the drone flies from there. And there are motors on the end that help the, tu the tube rotate while it's in flight. So that's how um, that part of it works. That's super cool. Yeah. So we have all sorts of questions about these bugs. Lena and Mr. Singh's class, Naomi, Scott, really want to know where you get these bugs do you okay. go and pick them by hand how do you get 250,000 bugs <laughs> there are actually companies around the world that rear or grow these bugs so um when we show up they're actually shipped to us in bottles that'll look like one of these usually um and um so they they come like this um and they're actually usually reared in greenhouses so they rear them on their own prey um their their favorite meals um depending on which bug they're they're trying to to grow um and then they collect them and they ship them out to the farmers and then we show up and release them and some of these bugs are what we call generalist predators so they eat a lot of different um bugs and some of them are specialists so they'll only feed on one or two species so that's where that like persimilis that we talked about earlier they only eat two spot spider mites um, so you'll see on the pictures here, a lace wing adult, which is the big green one with the pretty wings. Um, that is a generalist predator and the immature life stage, which is, uh, called a larvae is next to it. And it looks a little bit like an alligator, like a little tiny alligator with those pinchers. Um, the adult actually doesn't feed on other bugs. It only eats pollen. Um, and then below that are two specialists. So the minute pirate bug, which is the black and white guy, um, they feed on a pest called thrip and then mealybug destroyers. You can guess they eat mealybugs, which are the little white guys also in that photo. Um, and when you're talking about lace wings specifically, um, they, the adults really like pollen and flowers. And so a lot of farmers now are actually um, growing flowers in their fields to keep um, those good bugs around and keep them um, reproducing in the field where we want them to stay. Um, so that's one of the things that, that farmers are doing to really help um, those good bugs. Um, so the other things they're doing are um, when they are using pesticides, they're using pesticides that are a little more gentle for um, the beneficial insects so that they're not damaging those those bugs um they're only targeting the bad bugs um and they're also really keeping an eye on their fields it's called scouting and so they go out and they look in their fields for the bad bugs but they're also looking for the good bugs um and when they see those good bugs they know they have some helpers in the field um and can maybe rely on that a little bit more than they would um uh, have to use move on to using a pesticide Right. So Neha has a really good question here. She's curious. So the, the farmer scouts, that's something that all farmers do is they mm -hmm. go to check out their crops. They're right. actually out standing in their field stand when they do that. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? <laughs> Outstanding in their fields when they check their crops. <laughs> nice. It's a terrible good work thing. Quiet. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So in comes Parabug with the drones, with the bugs. How long does it take? for uh, the bugs to start having an impact 
on yeah. the bad bugs? Yeah, so usually it's um, growers will see some results after seven, maybe 10 days, two weeks sometimes. Um, but it's really kind of hard because when you're working with a living organism like good bugs, beneficial insects, um, if they don't like where they are, they don't like their climate, they might not be as eager to eat and to hunt. And so we have to be really careful that we're selecting the right bug, the right good bug for the climate that they're in. Because a bug that likes California might not like Michigan or New Jersey or Alberta or Saskatchewan. And so um, it, it's really, really important that farmers understand their bugs the good bugs and that we're out there releasing the right bug for their climate to make sure that they're getting those good results and getting good control of their pests. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So um, let's see, I found this question and now I lost it. This is so interesting and I hadn't thought about this. How long have been people, people been using good bugs for That's pest control? Do you That's know? That's a great question. It's actually um, been going on for at least 40 or 50 years. So historically, um, these these bugs weren't used so much in outdoor cropping systems, but they've been used in greenhouses for a really, really long time. Um, and before pesticides became available, um, growers in the area where I live, so I live in California, and in our area, we grow a lot of lettuce and broccoli and those kinds of things. And so before those, those pesticides were available, um, farmers actually would go out and collect ladybugs and they would bring ladybugs to their fields and release them there. Uh, ladybugs are another really great beneficial insect. Um, I don't recommend collecting them. It's not good for the environment. Um, always <laughs> yeah. go with a different, like a lacewing um, if you want to move them around. Um, but but back in those days, we didn't we didn't know about the the really the it, that it could be damaging right ecology. But they would go out and they would collect ladybugs and release those in the fields, and that was 40, 50 years ago. So so beneficial insects and biocontrol isn't a new concept, um, but the way that we're releasing them and the scale that they're being used now is, is very different. That's really really cool. Okay, so can you give us a rundown on how Parabug was created and sort yeah. of the process of getting from, hmm, maybe I'll use bugs as warriors to, I know, I'll drop them from a drone flying overhead. Yeah, so Chandler, <laughs> who is Parabug's president and founder, so he invented the drums and the, the mechanism, the part that goes up onto the drone. And he was actually in a class, a lot like yours in college. Um, and he was learning about bugs. We were learning about um, beneficial insects. And um, we were, I was in the class with him and we were sitting in that class and he was re really into technology. He's a very smart guy. Um, and he was really into drones at the time. And he said, these bugs are so lightweight. Like, why can't we put them in a drone? Um, so it really came from seeing a problem with um, how long it took to put out beneficial insects by hand. And then learning about those bugs, learning about drones and saying, why not? Why can't we do it this way? Um, and so that was really how Parabug came to be. It was like a little fun side project that has now turned into um, an international business. So. Right. I love that, that we can, we can look at something so and say, cool. you know, we know that this is a problem. I know that there's a possible solution. So why can't I answer it in this right. way? Which right. I think is really good advice for our students to take as we're looking forward. We're five minutes away from digging back into Minecraft and inventing something really cool to help mm -hmm. tackle climate change. Yeah. So why not? Why can't why can't Dan build a hover train for mass transit <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, all of these really inventive things that uh, are all just a part of, exactly. of making a change for our climate future. I really love it. Yeah. Okay. So there's one question that has been coming up over and over again. <laughs> uh, are the bugs, Rula especially wants to know this, when you eat the strawberries, does this mean you're eating bugs? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so, so, 
so usually, well, first of all, always wash your produce. First, first key term, key thing, always wash your produce. Organic, conventional, doesn't matter, wash your produce. Second, no, oftentimes you are not eating bugs. Um, I mean, bugs are a part of agriculture, farming, outdoor agriculture. It doesn't matter whether you're eating a strawberry or a head of lettuce. Um, there's always a potential for there to be a bug. Um, those bugs are not going to hurt you. Um, if they are there, um, oftentimes those are the good bugs um, that are still sticking around. Um, but no, generally you're not eating not eating bugs. Um, they like to stay on the plant, especially when you're talking about strawberries, because those leaves are where those bad bugs are. So they're hunting those bad bugs. So they're staying on the leaves and you're eating the fruit. Awesome. That's that's a, re a relief to strawberry <laughs> lovers like me. <laughs> it's a very big relief. Okay, Matthew had this question when you were talking about the ladybugs. Okay. Um, so why is our ladybugs uh, less ideal than a lacewing bug? To draw? So ladybugs, um, they actually migrate. And so they um, move into the Sierra Mountains to reproduce. Um, and when you see ladybugs in um, like a hardware store um, for sale, people have actually gone out and collected those from the wild. They're not laboratory reared. They're not greenhouse reared. Um, so oftentimes, um, by the time you see them in a hardware store, they're not really at their life stage anymore where they're really avid hunters. Um, mm -hmm. So by then they're looking to reproduce. And then a lot of the times with insects, after they reproduce, they, they pass away. And so um, they don't, they don't survive much longer than that. Um, okay. The other piece of that is, is when they're in those Sierras, um, there are a lot of different um, um, diseases that they can pick up. And so if you are moving them from one place to another, you're actually taking a disease from the Sierra Mountains and you're bringing them to your native population of ladybugs. Um, and and they're not um, you, you, you could potentially be making those ladybugs sick. Um, so we try not to move um, wild native species around um, is is the biggest piece of that. Um, you want to protect those good bugs that are that are native that are that you see every day in your gardens or or in the trees or in your parks um, you want to protect those mm -hmm. so buying lacewing that have been laboratory reared or greenhouse reared um greenhouse grown um is is much safer for the environment and safer for for ladybugs and other bugs um, right. to try and not introduce any diseases for them right so it's all about you know the inputs were putting into our crops and whether or not those are sustainable. Right. It's totally good advice. Okay. I have one wild question for you. Okay. How many have I dropped since its inception? How many bugs? <laughs> yeah. Oof, that's a hard question. I, I still need to look that up. We had that question yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Too. And I was like, come on, Jacqueline. <laughs> I know. I need, to, I need to try and find a number. Um, it is, it is in the millions. I love it. The hundreds a of million millions, million probably. Bugs. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we'll in in one field we may release five million bugs. Um, mm -hmm. So I would guess that we are now in the hundreds of millions of bugs released. <laughs> so it's pretty crazy. That is awesome. I love it. Yeah. Um, so we have this why not lens that you've brought to us. Why not drop why bugs not? on strawberries from a drone? <laughs> Do you have any other advice for our super genius scientist builders out there as they take on their um, build challenge? I think the most important part is figuring out what your problem is and then finding a solution from there. Um, and and even if something seems totally wild and, and out of the question, why not? Give it a shot. Um, you never know what's going to work. I love it. That's really good advice, Jacqueline. I am so thankful for you being here with us. Yes. Endlessly interesting. <laughs> thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you. Dan, any last questions? Um, many, but <laughs> I'll save them all for another <laughs> Many, day. but Dan also really needs to get into Minecraft. His fingers are itching. <laughs> so thank you, Jacqueline. We'll all say thank goodbye you. to you now. Thank you very much. Bye. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Okay, so we've learned right. about the bugs. Oh, this one.
Now it's time to dig into our build challenge. So we have this challenge for you. We'll be running this challenge all week long. It's the same question each time we're together. So we want you to think specifically in the frame of agriculture today. What is one invention that could help improve our climate's future? Now, Jacqueline had that really good advice that we should probably start with the problem first. So I just want to dig in before we start building down and review some of the problems that we found when we were looking at the farm and finding those rifts. So the inputs that farmers use on their produce to make it grow faster, to make it grow better, fit fertilizers and pesticides and insecticides can sometimes lead to desertification because they uh, are over treating the land. Lots of times too, there's lots of transport involved in getting those um, fertilizers to the, the farm. So that's when they've come up with the solution of having um, organic fertilizers like manure and potash and limestone. There's also the overgrazing issue. We know that land is hard to come by. So having enough space for a cattle, for cattle to graze appropriately is hard. One cow can eat something like a ton of grass throughout a summertime while it's growing. It's absolutely crazy. Um, we also know that we have to use big, big machines to farm our crops right now. There's no other solution. We have autonomous tractors that are saving emissions in, in slight ways as they farm because they're doing it as efficiently as possible. They're still very big machines. So maybe we're looking at the ways in which we harvest our crops when we're thinking about a solution. Um, there's also the transport to get um, a field of wheat to the um, grinders to make it into flour involves transport. To get that flour to the grocery store, to get into your bread involves transport. So there's a lot of transport involved. And along with buying food, there's waste and plastics and that can affect our rivers and oceans. Um, and we know that we are not super good at recycling plastics yet. So maybe if that's something you could think of a solution for. And finally, we know that a lot of produce in the world is lost or wasted um, simply because of our habits or because of the way it com comes to us. So we could maybe tackle food um, waste issues. Um, and there's also the purchasing local thing, which is really cool. You can cut down on, on emissions by just choosing to purchase produce that's um, closer to you. So that's a really quick rundown of the farm. Dan, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think that's a, that's a good, concise rundown. I'm already thinking ahead to what I'm going to try to build today. Um, awesome. Based on all that information. <laughs> okay, so Dan has an idea. I'm super curious what you out there are thinking. Now, I want to remind you all, if you don't have an idea yet, now might be a good time to pause and do some brainstorming. And remember Jacqueline's advice to start with the problem and look at the solution from a why not lens. So if you could do any wild thing in your wildest imagination, which luckily we have Minecraft to help us with that, what would you build to help solve climate change. Dan, what do you think? Oh, yeah, so many. Um, <laughs> but like you said, it's great that we have Minecraft here. Minecraft is the best for modeling out uh, so many different approaches. And yeah, we can try all sorts of different things. So I'm, I'm thinking today in terms of I really like this drone thing. Like I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm getting more and more into drones, uh, particularly now since Parabug has been talking about that. So I'm thinking also about like, how could we maybe use drones to actually harvest? So instead of making bigger and bigger machines that use more and more energy to harvest things, maybe we could use smaller things, but in larger quantities to do that, that harvesting. And how could we include AI to do that and renewable energy sources? So that's that's kind of where my mind is is rolling today. Mm -hmm. That's a really, that's not where I expected your mind to roll, but that's super interesting. <laughs> I like it. So Andreas has the idea of maybe we could use horses to um, solve the equipment issue. And you know what, that's really interesting because like Jacqueline said, it's a primitive solution. It's a solution. People have been using horses and oxen to <laughs> harvest crops forever. So, um, 
maybe that would be an interesting yeah. kind of similar thing to pair a bug. That's Matthew right. Has, uh, oh, go ahead, mm-hmm. Dad. So good. I was just saying, yeah, along those lines, um, you know, as somebody who's worked with technology for many years, frequently, you know, I think the, the go to is always, well, there's got to be a technological solution. But I always mm-hmm. try to, you know, look at the other side and go, is there a non technological solution that's actually easier, more climate friendly? And right. yeah, again, just it's just simpler and easier to do. So like in terms of planning out what you're doing to do today, like part of my build process is always a little bit of planning ahead of time, grab a pad of paper and a pencil. It's mm-hmm. simple, it's easy, and you can recycle it. Yeah, that's awesome. So Matthew has this idea of making batteries to store energy, mm-hmm. um, which is ingenious. Quentin has a good idea of maybe possibly creating like an indoor growing sort of situation so that we can oh, grow right. on top yeah. of each other. We saw that in the world. Uh, there's all sorts of awesome ideas coming in here. And I think, Dan, it is time to dig into Minecraft and start oh, yeah. the process. So there's one step to get to our build space. So make sure you follow down here because okay. this is important to get to where we're going to be building um, our That's invention. Right. So I've come full circle here. I'm back at the beginning yet. If you haven't had a chance to come through, you'll, you'll need to move back to this area here and click on Emily. So we have to take a book. And we can write in here and reflect on things, but I'm just going to get going to the build challenge and I'm going to say I'm done. And it's going to take me to a build challenge area. So we're going to teleport and we're going to build a sustainable farm or like we were discussing some sort of new idea or invention on top of this hospital. So once we click, let's go, it's going to teleport us and it's counting down. I like this. It's a suspenseful teleport. It's all about the little so. subtle things that, <laughs> you know, add to suspense and building and so forth. Yes. Minecraft. Okay, so we've got Emily over here again. Opportunity to build. All right, so um, the first thing I'm going to do here is I need some crops. So I'm actually going to go with, let's get rid of the camera. Let's get rid of this. I'm going to grab some coarse dirt and... So I'm the, gonna the roof. Oh, go ahead. Oh, Sorry, I'm just uh, I'm just uh, talking as I go along here. Sorry. That's okay. I just wanted to remind everybody that the rooftop is in creative mode. That's right. So you have access to the entire Minecraft inner um, inventory, which also means redstone for my Minecraft uh, super users out there. So you could potentially create something with redstone without having to go through all of the process to get there. It's all right there in your creative mode. So we are now in the build phase. Dan and I will be mostly quiet. If I see Dan doing something super duper cool, I'm going to stop him and explain to me <laughs> what is going on. Um, and if you have questions at all, please feel free to pop those in the form. I'll be watching the form for the rest of our session. We have about 20 minutes of build time and we will see you um, at the end so that we can walk through Dan's build a little bit and wrap up together. So enjoy your build time. Remember, we're here in the form to help in any way we can. And we hope you enjoy your quiet build time. they've got going here.
I'm seeing so many awesome ideas in this chat. Liam is building an eco-friendly house. Oh, wow. Alina is doing a full out farm on the top of this uh, nice. hospital roof. And I'm not sure if I understand the idea totally, but there's some sort of system to harvest the crop in their mind. So that's super cool. I love mm. it. If you want to share with us in the form which you're building, you're more than welcome to. I love to see you super genius. This is a cool one that just came in, Dan. It's a redstone drone harvester. <laughs> That's a super cool idea. <laughs> Phoenix had that idea. I love it. And I think maybe Dan is along something something along those lines, too. Mm -hmm. It's a great minds think alike sort of situation. <laughs> yes. <laughs>
Unfortunately, I have to give the five minute warning. It is true that all good things must come to an end. So we would like for you to finish up placing your final blocks and pause your game within five minutes. If you need more time, you can always pause this video or save your game and come back to the world and complete your build that way. So we'll have five more minutes of build time and then we'll chat with Dan about his build and wrap up. Okay, Dan, would you care to walk us through this super genius contraption that you've built? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay, so I've got here uh, a little field of uh, berries. And like I was kind of thinking earlier, I was kind of sketching out in my, my mind what I was going to do. And I was thinking, um, and these aren't to scale. These would be a lot smaller. But the idea is that basically you'd have clouds of these smaller drones. And these are sort of not flying drones, but... Uh, walking drones and they would go over your field and they would fertilize and water the plants. So there's, they're solar powered and they can go back and charge up. And I'm using anvils along back here to sort of represent batteries. Again, it's that using different elements in Minecraft to represent something else. I've got an observer block here at the front. That's sort of the eyes and the sensors and the, the computer brain of the drone. I've modeled them on insects because insects uh, as walking, uh, things are, you know, highly efficient and, and mm -hmm. you know, easy to get around multiple different types of terrain, particularly if they're smaller and they're operating in a field environment where there might be lots of troughs and, right. you know, things in the way. Um, so this one carries a tank of that fertilized water so it can hydrate and feed the plants as it walks over them. So it can fertigate. Fertigate, exactly. <laughs> I'm scared to say that word without your assistance. <laughs> Um, and then the other drones, once the, uh, the plants have, have matured and we have fruit, uh, we'll have collector ones that come out. So this one here is looking around, sensing the plants. So we can decide which ones are ready to harvest and which ones aren't. So it's going to have to go back over, go back over mm -hmm. again if they're ones that aren't quite ready. And it picks them up and it drops them in another drone that's following behind 
that's just collecting them kind of like what you see on the, the fields now you see the big harvester with the pickup or the, uh, the 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 big receiver truck at the back where it's dumping all the produce into mm -hmm. so i have one marching behind that'll do that and i didn't really have time i ran out of time and you might have seen i was trying to add a barrier block there from um a yeah. command line and mm -hmm. it was telling me that the cheats weren't enabled so i couldn't add it because i like i was going to have a flying drone that would fly over and sort of observe the whole process and see if there are any issues and that kind of thing mm -hmm. as these things were autonomously going around just sort of as a, as a fail failover method in case one of these things runs into a problem or something right. something can go out find out and and um, you know mitigate that that's cool so that's how you make things hover is you use a barrier block or a barrier <laughs> Setup. Well, and I mean, I was more or less thinking of it as so like normally I would just grab some dirt blocks, build up and then remove them after and then have something mm -hmm. hovering over it. I like to use the barrier blocks, though, if I'm making propellers, because I'll mm -hmm. use a carpet as my propeller and I'll have that in a certain way. And then I'll, it, carpets will just fall unless they have something to support them. But I want that thing that's supporting them to be invisible. So I'll use a right. barrier block to do that. Because as soon it'll show up in your inventory as a little red cross kind of uh, thing yeah. uh, once you have it. But as soon as you move off of that, it disappears. And so you have something that's more aesthetically pleasing. That is really cool. I did not know that. <laughs> that's, I learned Fair something blocks every are great. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's so, really I mean, cool. anytime you have a Minecraft element that needs to be anchored to something, and if you don't want to show what it's anchored to, use a barrier block. Like um, mm -hmm. I'll use that with ladders as well. If I'm making a ladder that goes up, but I just want the ladder hanging down. I don't want it to have to be on a wall or on a, a, a you know a, mm -hmm. a row of blocks that are visible. I'll use a barrier block, put them up, and then attach the ladders to them. And you'd never know that there was a block there. Yeah, that's amazing. I love it. Well, I think it is time to wrap up. So we have one last question for our class. What impact can you have on climate change? Now, I know you all are super engaged in your build, so you can definitely send this one in when you're good and ready. <laughs> uh, I just want you all to think about the fact that you, you can make a difference toward climate change. You all have these super genius brains that have these really creative ideas. You have teachers who are super passionate about bringing you um, people like Jacqueline that can share with you crazy, amazing, innovative ideas that are all having an impact on climate change. So go ahead and give us an answer to this whenever you feel ready. Dan and I want to say thank you for having us in your class today. We are so thrilled to be able to do this with you, to play Minecraft with all of you awesome students. Uh, thank you to your teachers for connecting us today. Dan, do you have any last words? Um, no, just, I, well, I guess, uh, you know, don't get frustrated. Plan your steps out. It's okay to make mistakes in Minecraft. That's, that's what it's there for. Um, you know, frequently, uh, I'll build something. I won't like it at all. And I'll just tear it down and start over again. So yeah. be flexible. Right. That's really good. Really good last advice. I think we'll leave it on that. Thank you, everybody. And have a good rest of your day.